Hello, everyone. My name is Kate Richardson. I'm an extension entomologist with Utah State University. And today I want to talk with you about invasive nuisance pests. And I'm going to apologize up front. I'm battling a little bit of a cold, so bear with me here. So let's talk about what invasive nuisance pests actually are. So nuisance pest is any pest that is causing injury or annoyance to animals or humans that's bites, stings, smells, or just a general undesirable presence. Um, this can be in homes, buildings, pretty much anywhere um, that you don't want to have insects, but you do. Um, sometimes these insects can cause a little destruction of home and products, um, but generally that's not a major destruction. It can just be a little bit of staining here or there or some unsanitary things going on. Nuisance pests typically do not cause severe damage to crops like fruits and vegetables. They're not the ones that are going to destroy a forest, um, kill your ornamental trees or your lawn, um, and they typically don't cause structural damage. Maybe a little bit of structural damage, but not anything significant. In general, they're just annoying, which is why we're going to call them nuisance pests. Now, um, we're focusing on four pests that are nuisances, but they are also invasive, meaning they are not um, naturally here. So these are pests that have been introduced, maybe accidentally, maybe purposely, um, but have become fairly well established in Utah. So they are ones that I'm gonna ask you, you and tell you, <laughs> you don't need to report these to us or to UDAC. Um, they're pretty well established and we know that they're out there at this point. So for the first little bit, I'm going to talk about three insects, the red firebug, the elm seed bug, and the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And then I'm going to talk about some management practices for all of them together. That way I don't have to say the same things over and over um, because the management is pretty similar for all three of these. Uh, then we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about the European paper wasp and we'll talk about it and its management, which ends up being a little bit different from these other insects. So the first insect is the red fire bug. They're, uh, to me, a very pretty insect. They're pretty distinctive with their coloration, but they are native to Central Europe and Asia. And right now we are finding them in Salt Lake in Northern Utah. Um, they were first detected in 2008 in Salt Lake, which is relatively recent. And then uh, really recently, they're now being found in Idaho in Twin Falls in the Burley area. So with these insects, some of the forms, they have a couple different forms. Um, I'll talk about that with their wings, but some are excellent flyers. Um, so far, they seem to thrive in urbanized areas. They are, a lot of their host plants are actually kind of weedy. Um, so anywhere that those are allowed to grow, they tend to do well there. Um, they also have a wide array of those plants, so you can really take advantage of lots of things. Another problem with this insect is there is a lack of registered insecticides because they're kind of a newer pest, um, and so there's not a lot of chemical control to battle them. They are fairly cold tolerant, which means they are doing well even in Logan winters. Um, and they also have some uh, genetic plasticity things going on that make them pretty flexible uh, to new environments. But with all of that said, they are likely to spread throughout the rest of urbanized uh, Utah and Idaho, maybe some other places in surrounding states. Um, we're not entirely sure. So it's one that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, adult identification, these guys are pretty distinctive with their vibrant red and black coloration. They have two sets of black dots on their backs, too big and too small. They have pretty prominent eyes that are kind of bulging out of the sides of their heads. Um, I'm showing here a picture of the short winged version. Um, so those red wings don't go all the way to the ends of the abdomen there. You can see um, that black part sticking out. And these insects are similar in size to a box elder bug, if you know what those are. So that's something you can compare them to. Um, some adult lookalikes I want to point out. These are insects that are not um, invasive, but that doesn't mean they're not nuisance pests. Um, I know box elder bugs give some people a hard time as well, but uh, we're focusing on the invasive ones today. So 
with the red fire bug, sometimes it can get confused for the box elder bug because of that black and red coloration um, or the small milkweed bug as well. But you're going to really be looking for those pairs of spots are going to be distinctive from other insects. And I'm showing here a fully winged adult. You can see um, there's those red wings and then there's some membranous uh, kind of see-through black wings that are covering the end of the abdomen on this one. The short-winged adult that I showed earlier is the most common one that we see in Utah. It's the one that I see around the most, but this fully winged adult is out there as well and they are the better flyers. So. As far as nymphs or the young insects go, all of them show a line of three black dots down the back, um, and they're all gonna have kind of an orange or red coloration. The younger nymphs don't really have wing pads, but then when they get older, they do have black wing pads on their back. Um, those are where those wings are developing, so nymphs can't fly um, until they develop into adults. A couple of the nymph lookalikes are um, the same insects, which sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't. Sometimes uh, nymphs can look very different from their adult forms, but in this case, they match up. So we have that small milkweed bug that has similar rows of spots, but um, it only has two down the center instead of three. And then the box elder bug, we get quite a few calls where they're not sure what they have, if it's the red fire bug or the box elder bug. Um, but the box elder bugs don't have that line of spots down their back, but they do have that bright red coloration as well. So as far as host plants go, we see these guys seem to have a good association with mallow plants. Um, so these can be a kind of weedy kind of um, growing on the side of a house or kind of in that parking strip. Um, sometimes they're just kind of wherever they want to be and aren't very controlled, and that can lead to these insects um, taking advantage of those there. They tend to feed on the seeds for these plants. Um, they've been associated with hollyhock, hibiscus, and linden trees as well. For their life cycle, they're, so far we've seen about one generation per year um, in Utah. Their eggs are laid in the spring. Like I said, the nymphs will feed on those seeds and leaves. There are five instars or five nymph stages until they become adults. And then when adults are mating, they can often be seen attached like this in this photo for long periods of time, um, usually days up to a week even. Um, have quite a few host plants. So they mainly have been found around mallow plants. Um, these are kind of sometimes weedy plants, um, and so that's often where you can find them um, kind of in those strips um, by the street. Um, so sometimes clearing out some of that foliage can help a little bit. Um, they will feed on the seeds as they are nymphs. Their life cycle, so far what we're seeing is there's about one generation per year. The eggs are laid in the spring, the nymphs will hatch and feed on seeds and leaves. There's about five instars or nymphal stages. Um, and then you'll often see these guys will be attached for long periods of time, um, days at a time even um, as they're mating. So as these insects develop, um, they often will seek shade during the day. They don't like to be in direct sunlight. Um, and so during the heat of the day is sometimes when they're causing their most um, nuisance problems. Um, when you can find them on homes and buildings, um, you'll find large aggregations during the late fall um, on some of those host plants I mentioned. And then eventually they will come and try and enter the home seeking overwintering sites. In terms of their damage, um, we're talking about, like I said, intrusion, annoyance, um, they can cause fecal spots, so when they poop, it can stain and leave marks on your windowsill, wherever they're coming in. They have a foul odor, um, that's one of their defense mechanisms, so that can be pretty unpleasant, especially if you're trying to get them out of your house and you squish them, they'll smell really bad. Um, they also, because of their bright red coloration, they can cause some permanent staining to furniture. Um, they are not considered a health threat at this point, just kind of an annoyance. So 
Um, that's what we're talking about with red fire bugs. Again, I'll kind of go over the management of them all together as a group. So we'll switch gears and we'll talk about elm seed bugs. This is one, um, I think that when I was the arthropod diagnostician, I got the most calls about. Um, it's gotta be up there. Um, they are originally from the Mediterranean. There's about 21 species of this genus. Um, but this is the particular one that's been bothering people around here. The first detection of elm seed bug was in 2009, uh, again, in Idaho. So we're talking about Ada Canyon counties. And then since then, we've expanded to a whole lot of different states. Um, we're, and it's now up into Canada as well. We're... Again, with this one, where it's a fairly newly introduced species, we're not sure exactly how far they will spread into the United States, but it's thought that wherever there are elm trees, particularly Siberian elm, that this insect will likely spread there as well. Um, the first detection in Utah was in 2014, and since then, we the Utah Plant Pest Lab has received calls and samples um, from every part of the northern Utah down to around Moab. Um, so it's been festering here for a while, and then um, populations have reached fairly noticeable levels, especially for quite a few people. Um, you can identify this insect by its um, kind of brown-gray coloration. It's got some alternating bands on the sides of the abdomen. This picture is fairly blown up. Um, you'll see it more like that picture down in the bottom left where I have it compared to a box elder bug. So they're about the third of a size of a box elder bug, but they have this brown and black. And then when you see them from a distance, they kind of look kind of grayish. Um, a good way to make sure you know what you're looking at um, is actually to flip these guys over and then they have that bright red underside. Um, so that's something you can look for as well. Um, again, I'll say it a few times during the presentation, but if you ever are uncertain about what you have, you can always shoot us some pictures um, and we can try and help you figure it out. Some of the adult lookalikes, again, we get the same um, kind of insects that look similar, but they are about three times the size. Um, so that's one way to differentiate them. And then for nymphs, they look similar, very similar to the red fire bug nymph, but they won't be quite as bright in coloration and they only have two dots on their back. Um, people will also find these shed skins sometimes and wonder what they are. So there's a picture of those as well. Um, you can often find the nymphs in the spring or summertime, especially on elm trees um, and sometimes on the side of houses as well. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures of the nymph lookalikes as well. Again, we have some of the same insects, but a couple of new ones as well. Um, nymphs can be pretty hard to identify, so your best bet is always to send us a picture. Um, elm seed bugs, as the name suggests, uh, love elm trees. They've also been recorded on linden, oak, and birch. Um, and while they like to reside on these trees, they usually don't cause any noticeable tree damage. Um, they're pretty minimal in terms of what they're actually doing to plants. I'm gonna get a drink here so I don't lose my voice. <laughs> As far as the life cycle goes, these also have one generation per year so far. Um, from what we're seeing, their eggs are laid in the springtime around the elm flowers, um, and then the nymphs will feed on the seeds and leaves, but not cause anything noticeable. Um, they will go through their metamorphosis similar to other um, true bugs where they have that egg nymph, um, a couple nymph stages, and then they go to adulthood. Um, when I talk about the nymphs, they have those wing pads, but they can't fly. Those are their developing wings. And then once they um, will develop their full wings, then they will be able to fly. So as far as their life cycle, 
Um, they are kind of interesting because they become a big problem starting in early and mid July in Northern Utah. Um, usually most of our um, common nuisance insects come indoors in the fall to find overwintering sites and escape the cold. But elm seed bugs tend to peak in the summer months, which is a little bit different. But they like to get away from the heat, and so they come inside for the cool weather, or weather, <laughs> the cool uh, inside temperatures. But um, they also like to be on the shady sides of structures rather than sunning themselves. Um, but they're usually located near um, elm trees, um, so the sides of roofs and um, houses during that time. Um, we have seen some reports of the elm seed bugs infesting homes um, when there's elm trees nearby. Um, and so that can be one of the things that we're going to talk about in terms of management is making sure we do whatever we can to try and keep them out, but we'll talk about that. Their damage is similar to the red fire bugs where they're annoying. You don't really want them in your house. You don't want them on your food. <laughs> um, they can cause quite a bit of fecal spots like my photos are showing. Um, they also have an odor, not quite as bad as the red fire bug, but still pretty potent, um, which can make them extra annoying when you're trying to get rid of them and you disturb them and then they smell. Um, they're also not considered a health threat at this time. All right, so our third insect here is the multicolored Asian lady beetle. It's also been called just the multicolored lady beetle, just the Asian lady beetle, sometimes the harlequin lady beetle. Um, it's got a lot of different names, but it is originally from Eastern Asia. This insect has kind of an interesting history. It was first released for biological control um, in 1916 in California. So that was because these um, ladybugs have a really good ability to consume aphids, which I'm sure many of you know and hate. <laughs> they can be quite annoying to control. So it was released for biological control purposes. Um, and then there were additional releases in the 70s and 80s. And then in 1988, they found some pretty extensive populations in New Orleans. And then it has continued to kind of spread and establish. It's now well established throughout North and South America. Um, and it's kind of unclear if this was because of those purposeful releases or accidental introductions or a combination of the two. Um, not really sure, but it is here and it looks like it is here to stay. Um, the One of the tricky things is that there are very many uh, different color variations of this lady beetle. Um, the most common color form we see here in Utah is kind of an orange red, anywhere in there, sometimes a little bit yellowish. And usually it's got quite a few spots, like 18 to 19. Um, but I show you a picture here of quite a few of those different color variations, which can make them tricky. But there's one thing that you can usually use to identify this one, and it's this distinctive M shape marking that they have on their pronotum or that plate right behind their head. It's usually a black M on a white or a cream background. Sometimes the markings can be broken up a little bit. Um, but it should still be identifiable. We have many native ladybugs that look similar, so um, it can be hard to figure out. I'd say the hardest one is that the two-spotted ladybug also kind of has that M coloration um, on its head, but it only will have those two spots, so if there's ever any question, we can help you figure it out, but I just wanted to show you some of the native ladybugs that we have here in comparison. Nymphs typically look like mini blue-gray alligators. Um, they're kind of interesting looking, um, and then they will have these orange or yellow markings. Um, nymphs are actually the most useful as biological control agents just because um, they are those hungry little teenagers and they just eat, 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 eat. <laughs> um, 
I think they can um, consume up to 5,000 aphids in their lifetime. Um, so that's pretty good in terms of biological control, but we'll talk about some of their uh, negative aspects here in a second. But um, in Utah, we're seeing up to six generations per year, and the female will lay several hundred eggs in her lifetime. So um, they can spread, um, have large populations quite quickly, which can be good when they're consuming aphids. But when they run out of aphids or other prey, um, they will actually feed on some fruits. So there's been reports of them feeding on grapes, apples, raspberries other small fruits. And there's actually a problem as well where they will contaminate grapes, grape and wine juices um, with their bitter tasting blood. If any of them get smashed into that um, wine or there's any contamination, it can end up really messing with the taste of the wine. So they're seeing some of those issues uh, more in California um, in vineyards, but some interesting stuff going on there. So some of the reasons that we're not as much of a fan <laughs> of these versus our native ladybugs is that one, they are out competing our native ladybugs in many aspects, um, which can be unfortunate um, just in terms of our diversity. So if they take away all of their prey, then we might see um, some threatened populations of our native ladybugs. We also are seeing fruit damage and again, um, annoyance. There's been some pretty viral pictures of just hundreds and hundreds of these ladybugs coming inside houses. Um, they also will cause fecal spots. Um, they have a little bit of an odor and can cause staining. And these guys can also, um, they can bite. It's usually very minor and just very short-lived discomfort, not really a huge deal, but can happen. Um, so I want to talk about the management of these first three insects. Um, when we talk about management um, in terms of IPM, um, we really want to talk about it in a way where we're using all of the tools in our toolbox. Um, and so what that means is using methods when and where we should. Um, and that starts with prevention. So that starts with identification and understanding pests. And you all are participating in that now, which is great. Um, just coming to an informational webinar is a great first step. Um, and then we want to take the next step and do some cultural control and sanitation measures. And then as the pest um, increases, if we have increased populations or stress or problems going on, then we can upgrade to physical and mechanical methods, um, up to biological control. And then lastly, we want to use chemical control. And I'm going to talk about chemical options a whole lot in this presentation, because for one thing, there aren't a whole lot, because some of these insects are fairly new. There aren't labeled and registered pesticides specifically to treat them. Um, and in a lot of cases, your other methods are going to be cheaper and easier and more effective um, and safer for your kids, your pets, your family members as well. I mentioned that there's a lack of registered insecticides in Utah for some of these, um, especially like the red fire bug doesn't have a whole lot. Um, and then some of them have so far been shown to be fairly tolerant of insecticides as well. So <laughs> that's why I'm going to focus um, a little bit more on some of our other control methods, but um, we can also talk about chemical control when it comes time. So some of the best things that you can do, and I've given this advice um, so many times, but it's always don't let them in. <laughs> That's the best thing you can do in the first place is seal every crack and crevice that you have. Um, caulk is your best friend. Um, weather stripping is great. You can use um, those door sweeps. Um, I need to do that to this place that I've moved into. There's a lot of cracks and a lot of stuff coming in, um, but they can often enter through places in the roof um, and the eaves. Um, so you might want to seal up places in your attic or if not, seal from your attic into your home. 
So those are some of the things that you can do. But um, in terms of controlling this insect from coming in your home, just don't let them in in the first place. Um, another thing you can do is really clear out vegetation from right next to your house. Um, I usually recommend about a three to five foot barrier between your house and any plants that you have. Insects like plants, and when those plants are next to a building, they like to jump ship and come over. Um, that also can be in terms of trees that have big branches over your house. Um, those can drop lots of insects, especially if we're talking about elm seed bugs and there's elm trees. Um, maybe cutting back some of those branches might help. But uh, you can also clean up debris and seeds, um, leaves, anything like that, dead plants. Um, and then another thing is a lot of insects like to hide in wood that's stored outside. So um, it can be tricky, but I generally recommend storing firewood um, at least a little ways away from the house um, and then trying to shake it off before you bring it inside. So those are a few of the things that you can do. Um, and then we also have physical and mechanical control. Um, this is kind of a weird thing, but hear me out. This is one of the best ways that you can clean up insects that do come inside. Um, if you just vacuum them with the vacuum, it will squish them and it will smell bad. <laughs> um, so something that you can do is use um, your vacuum hose and put some tights, um, some pantyhose, tie a knot in it and kind of thread it in there. So there's a little sack inside that vacuum. Um, and then you can use that, vacuum all the insects up. When you're done, take it out, tie a knot, go chuck it in the trash, where whatever you want to do. Um, you can also use a wet vac. Um, you can put a couple inches of water in the bottom with some dish soap, um, vacuum the bugs. They will land in the water, they'll sink. The soap will help break them down and kill them. Um, and those are a few ways to help get rid of them in a way that will hopefully not cause any staining or smelling. <laughs> um, uh, and one of the only pests that I've talked about that does have some um, management in terms of chemicals um, is elm seed bugs. Um, you can use some pyrethroid insecticides. I recommend doing this as a structural perimeter. So going around the edges of your house or on the edges of windows, um, stuff like that if necessary. But to make sure you're not using more chemicals than is necessary, it really helps if you take a step back, look at the house um, and assess where are the insects coming from look for the trees that might be the source, um, and then kind of specifically target those areas. You don't need to spray the entire home. Um, it might seem like that is a good approach um, just to be sure to get everything, but that can actually usually take out some beneficial insects, which generally have longer life cycles than pest insects, and so you will end up with more pests in the long run, which is unfortunate, but um, we will try to use things in moderation, but um, pyrethroids are what I would recommend, but always read the label and make sure that um, you're following instructions carefully when you're doing that. But um, doing the foundations, the undersides of eaves, um, any cracks and crevices as well. But um, the long-term um, solution is really to seal those things up because insecticides will fade um, and then they'll just try coming right back in. So our last insect I want to talk about is the European paper wasp. Um, this one is native to southern Europe and northern Africa. Uh, you've probably seen them around. Um, they were first detected in Massachusetts in 1970. Um, they were pretty well documented excuse me, by 1995, and then our first records in Utah were in 1995. Um, some, a recent study in 2020 looked at some of their distribution, and um, I have that map shown here. <coughs> excuse me. So 
we have a lot of flying um, things that are black and yellow. And so it can be a little bit hard, but I'm gonna tell you a couple of the things that you can use to identify these guys. Um, they have bright orange antennae, and that's usually a pretty good one to look at. Um, they will have folded wings, a thin waist, and then a narrow abdomen. Um, so the best way is just to show you a comparison. Um, we have a Western yellow jacket in Utah that looks pretty similar. So we put them side by side for you guys to look at. Um, one of the things you can see that's pretty obvious is those bright orange antennae look different. And then that narrow abdomen. Um, yellow jackets look pretty chunky. They have a big body, um, kind of squarish at the top of that abdomen where the paper wasps have more kind of a football shaped um, that end segment of their body. So adults um, will create honeycomb nests. These are usually up high or in enclosed places. Um, they usually have about 20 to 30 adults um, and that's for the European paper wasp on the left. Whereas our yellow jackets will nest in the ground. Um, these nests can be up to the size of a basketball. They'll usually have 4,000 to 5,000 adults. So a lot of adults. Um, but you usually won't be quite as aware of these nests. Um, and they do have that, um, they will have that similar nesting structure, but they always have kind of an envelope around the outside. Um, so they won't look like this kind of umbrella honeycomb shape. So some of the lookalikes we have here, we have a Western paper wasp that is native. You can tell them apart. Usually they have a little bit more of a red coloration and they have a really skinny kind of stick um, waist before they have that abdomen. Um, and this picture on the right is showing um, some size comparisons for you. We also have a bald-faced hornet in Utah, they are black and white. Sometimes they can look a little bit yellowish, but um, usually you can tell them apart by that black and white coloration. And their nests as well will have um, kind of a big envelope over them and just have one hole as an opening. Um, the Western yellow jacket I talked about, but wanted to show you for the size comparison here. And we have that Western or European honeybee sometimes can look similar. Usually these guys are much fuzzier, fluffier. Um, so that's one way that you can tell them apart. Um, so um, we have a couple other lookalikes that are less common, um, but we have an elm sawfly that can look a little bit similar. Um, we usually don't see a whole lot of some of the rest of these, um, just kind of depends on where you're at. But in general, um, these are pretty common. I'd say they're one of the most common wasps that most people see is the European paper wasp at this point. Um, they actually can be really great in terms of biological control where they eat a lot of caterpillars. Um, they also can attack grasshoppers, so sometimes people ask me what they can do for grasshoppers, and I say leave the wasps alone. So, I mean, there's good and bad to all insects, um, but they also have been known to eat ripe fruit in terms of cherries, grapes, um, sometimes other small fruits, so um, they can cause that fruit damage, which no one wants. Not severe amounts, but just enough to be annoying. <clears throat> In terms of their life cycle, the fertilized queens will overwinter in protected areas. Um, and so that's stuff like bark and leaf litter. Um, and so they will overwinter by themselves. They will emerge in the spring and found a new nest. They typically won't use old nests. They'll um, almost always make a new one. And so they'll construct these anywhere they can, any enclosed areas. Um, often on the sides of houses, up high, in a bush as well, um, pretty much anywhere <laughs> you can um, think of. But when I talk about identification, um, I know a lot of you probably won't want to get close enough to be able to identify these guys. Um, but I think even from afar, you can see that those orange antennae are pretty uh, noticeable. <coughs> Excuse me. 
For damage, um, these um, we talked about outcompeting natives with the lady beetles, and um, these insects will do that as well. They will outcompete native paper wasps um, for resources. Um, they might have negative impacts on native caterpillars, which some people see as a plus because caterpillars eat all the crops. Um, so kind of goods and bads there. Um, one of the big things with these guys as a nuisance is that they are a health threat in terms of staining. Um, and they look really scary to children and adults. But in reality, these guys are relatively non-aggressive. They usually don't mess with you unless you mess with them. Um, they don't actually scavenge. Um, yellow jackets will scavenge. They're the ones that will come bug you at a picnic, will come fly around and try to um, drink your soda, eat your food, <laughs> um, and will sting you and kind of get aggressive that way. But um, these paper wasps are relatively not aggressive. If you're messing with their nest, that might be another case. But if they're just flying around, they're usually um, pretty calm. And like I mentioned, on rare occasions, they might feed on uh, fruits that are left out, um, which can be annoying. Um, and as far as a nuisance, the real problems come down to if they nest in a place you don't want them to. Um, and so that can be hard to deal with, especially if you can't reach or get to that nest. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about their management. So, Things that you want to do, you want to reduce nesting sites in the early spring. Um, would you rather take care of a nest that has one wasp or 30 wasps? <laughs> um, and so as soon as you see one, um, you can take care of it. And again, not all of these need to be taken care of, need to be managed. Um, you have to make your own assessment in terms of is it in a place that might cause harm to people or kids um, that might be kind of a scary place or is it on a back barn somewhere that it's not gonna bug anyone? So you have to think about what's going on there, but um, reduce the nesting sites in the early spring. Um, you can seal openings like we talked about, Kalk is your friend. Um, they like to nest in playground equipment, which can be dangerous for kids, um, they like fencing, any open tube is appealing to them. Um, so those can be places. There have been some interesting studies done about paint colors um, recently, and they found that the wasps do not like to make their nests on kind of a bright sky blue. Um, I need to follow up and read some of it, but um, it's pretty interesting. They were seeing that if you painted like your eaves, the underside or the side of your house with that bright blue color, you could really reduce the amount of nesting wasps, which is a really interesting concept to me. But um, take down those nests early in the season when they're small. Um, you can do this with insecticides, um, but I generally recommend doing it in the morning or evening. Why I say that is because it's cooler, so the wasps are going to be a little more snoozy, less active, and also it's better if you're using insecticide to make sure and um, get them while they're in their nest. If you're just spraying the nest, um, you might not be as effective if everyone is out foraging. Um, and like I said, the nests will generally not be reused. Um, Occasionally they are, but if there is a nest um, nearby that might indicate and signal to a queen that's coming out from overwintering that that's a good place to nest and she might found one nearby. Um, so in the winter, when it's nice and cold, there's no one in the nest, the queens are out overwintering and some other debris, they won't be in the nest. Excuse me, you can take down those nests, smash them, remove them, put them in the trash, um, and that might help, and then clean off the area, that might help discourage them from coming back to nest in that same place the next year. Um, I will mention that there are lots of commercially available wasp traps um, that are, you know, the bright yellow traps. Um, they're kind of, they've got that hourglass kind of cone inside of them. A lot of people will use these to try to help deal with um, the paper wasps, but in reality, 
Um, those are designed to attract certain kinds of yellow jackets. Um, oftentimes the baits that are involved there have fruit juices, fresh meat, or a chemical um, peptal brew. I don't remember what it's called off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> anyway, but there's some chemicals there that are pheromones specifically for yellow jackets. Um, and so those will not be effective. You can put up as many as you want. Um, you might get one or two paper wasps, but generally those fill up with uh, yellow jackets. So um, using registered insecticides and removing nests um, are going to be your best options for the European paper wasp. Um, and when you're doing any of that, either um, call a professional if you want to, or make sure you have appropriate clothing covering, you know, you might want gloves or long sleeves or anything. Um, if you're messing with their home, they might want to come sting you. So, and they can sting repeatedly. And um, generally it's some discomfort for a little while, but um, if you are allergic, then there can be some serious issues as well. But um, you, like I mentioned, you might not always need to take down the nest. So um, you can make judgment calls or you can always talk to us if um, you need some advice. Um, so that's what I have in terms of our insects, but um, I want to talk for a few minutes about some of the resources available to you. Um, we have so many fact sheets here um, that Utah Pest has produced. So I do have a full fact sheet available for the red firebug. Um, the elm seed bug has one as well. There's a general one for yellow jackets, hornets, and paper wasps that includes all of those um, kind of stinging friends that we have and how to deal with them um, and so many other things. And if we don't have a fact sheet on something that you're looking for, let us know. We can always make one. Um, but uh, these are great resources um, to have that will give you full detailed information on their life cycle, uh, management practices, all of that good stuff. Um, another great resource that we have at Utah State is our pest diagnostics. So we have the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostic Lab. Um, we have many, many free services in terms of you can email us pictures, you can text us pictures. Um, I have that phone number for you there. Um, we also have some services where you can send in physical samples and we'll, we'll diagnose it for you. But um, this is a service that you can really take advantage of. It's um, very helpful and make sure you know exactly what you have before you treat it. Um, so I'll leave that up there for you for just a second if you want to take a picture of that phone number or anything. Um, all the information can be found on our website as well. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff to explore on there. I have the QR code for you that should take you straight there. Um, we have a number of books and guides as well as um, we have some IPM pest advisories that you can sign up for that are free that will keep you updated um, on all of the current pest things that we have going on in Utah. So. Lots of ghost stuff for you guys. I'll leave that up for just a second. And that's what I have for you guys today. <laughs>